speaker. Our next speaker is Tun Keen, who was born and brought up in Arakan State in Burma. His grandfather was a parliamentary secretary during the democratic period in Burma. And although well-established and respected, alongside a million other ethnic Rohingya, Tun Keen was not recognized as a citizen of Burma. He is one of the founder members and current president of the Burmese Rohingya Organization in the United Kingdom, which has been a leading voice for the Rohingya people around the world. Tun Keen is the first Rohingya who spoke to the Rohingya issue for the United States Congress in 2010. He's briefed officials on the continuing human rights violations that are committed against the Rohingya populations at the British Parliament, the Swedish Parliament, the Moroccan Parliament, the Canadian Parliament, the European Union's Parliament, the US Senate, US Congress, the State Department, the United Nations Indigenous Forum in New York, and the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. He wrote articles in British Independent Newspaper, in the Democratic Voice of Burma, and the Mazima Burmese Medias. Tun Keen has been a featured speaker on Rohingya's rights for the BBC, Sky Al Jazeera, and many other outlets. He's also published opinion pieces in the Huffington Post, the Democratic Voice of Burma, and Mazima Burmese Medias. Tun Keen graduated with civil engineering from London. He received a leadership award from the Refugees International in Washington, D.C. in April 2015 for his relentless effort working on the Rohingya issue, and we are very pleased to welcome him today, Mr. Tun Keen. Assalamu alaikum. It is a great honor to speak at this event today. I would like to express many thanks to the members of Burmese American Muslim Association organizing at this event, uh, organizing this event timely. I'm standing today in front of you as a genocide survivor, I will be speaking today how Burmese military systematically persecuting the, our community. I mean, this genocide is not happening in 2017 August. It's been going on for a long time. You know, Burma independence 1948 from British. After that, we had the most progressive time in Burma, we call it. What is democratic period time? On that time, Rohingya Memphis were there. Rohingya language was broadcasted from Burma Radio Broadcasting Program three times a week. On that time, my grandfather was a member of parliament and I, I was not recognized as a citizen of Burma. And my mother's grandfather was the first judge in Northern Arkan. So, how military game through here, how they start up. In 1962, when General Nguyen coup power, he stripped up our ethnic rights. How? He stopped Rohingya language broadcasting program from Bami's radio broadcasting program, uh, uh, broadcasting. And Rohingya a student union was there. And Rohingya were participated all the cultural events, all the ethnic events, like as you all know, February 12th is Union Day in Burma. With other ethnic groups, Rohingya been participated. And he stopped all those programs. And if you look at 1978, King Dragon Operation, General Ling Wing started where many Rohingya villages village had 
and teachers, educated people being arrested and about 275,000 Rohingya fled. We have seen international pressure at that time. On that time, because of international pressure, like what's happening these days, Rohingya were repatriated from Bangladesh, but they did not take as a citizen of Burma. They were repatriated back as a stateless people. And what's happened? 1982, law was introduced by General Newing. That law deprived basic fundamental rights of the Rohingya. Uh, rights of the Rohingya. That law violates international customary law. Because of that law, I am not a citizen of Burma. Because of that law, millions of Rohingya in Burma, they are not citizens. So we have seen 1988 uprising in Burma. When 1988, September 18, military coup power again, they step up another plan. And 1988-82 law was systematically uh, they implemented 1989. Rohingya, we have, my father and everyone, we had NRC. They taken away our NRC and they given us white card, which is neither citizenship nor foreign. So they started implementing 1982 law. Rohingya were not given citizenship card, which is national statutory card. And I have seen, I was in Arkhana State that time. They started up restriction of movement, restriction on marriage, restriction on education, confiscation of land. When I was in Arkhana State, like I couldn't go to one place to another. Like from Butidong to Sitwe, if we need to go, we need to get a pass, it takes like two to three days. You, can, you have to give a bribe. For example, if you want to travel from LA to San Diego, you need to get a pass. Even though your grandfather, your mother, your grandfather serious illness facing, you cannot visit, you cannot see them. You must get a, 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 a gov uh, from government authorities, you, you must get approval. I passed through that. And as a Rohingya, I couldn't go to the university even though I passed matriculation in Burma. Thousands of Rohingya who passed matriculation, their lives been destroyed. They couldn't go to the university, their lives been ended up after they passed O level. We've been seeing that since 1995. When I was in Arkhan State, I have seen my brother's friends, when they want to get married, they need to get a pass. And it takes two to three years for the marriage application. You know, you can get that marriage application after providing a big bribe. It's about 1,000 US dollar, where general Rohingyas, they can't provide it. Very few Rohingyas, they can provide that bribe. So many Rohingyas, when I was in Arkhan State, we have seen they married secretly. No, they can't wait for two to three years because, you know, it's a marriage application is pending two to three years, so they just married. Secretly, and government found out they sent us to jail, five to seven years. It's been mentioned, UN special, former UN special reporter Thomas Cantana in his report in 2010. In Buti Down Jail, you can see all the prisoners were uh, uh, arrested, uh, sentenced, they married secretly, and because of alleged marriage. That is what UN, former UN special reporter mentioned. For the Rohingyas in Arkhan state, when I was in Arkhan, I have seen my father's own land being confiscated by the military. And they brought non-Rohingyas. 
and many Rohingyas lands been confiscated. That is what I have seen when I was in Arkan. And you can see now, they strip up our ethnic rights, they strip up our citizenship rights, they impose restriction on movement, restriction on marriage, restriction on education, confiscation of lands, and the people being fled again uh, in 1992, you know. That time Rohingya were repatriated back again. That was the second time. And what's happened? If we look back, so-called reform came in Burma in 2010 where former President Thein Sein came to power, USDP, military back USDP government came to power, we have seen. Anti-Rohingya campaign was spread up everywhere. In Sitwe, Butidong, Maundo, Mandalay, Rangoon, you know, many cities, anti-Rohingya. These are illegal immigrants. We must drive them out. There is no Rohingya. And they've been released a book, which is called Pisama, Ra uh, Pisama Rawun. You know, Pisama Rewu, Pisama Yewu, the book they publish, the military, uh, the police officer, and highly uh, respected Buddhist monks been signed there, and they released that. This is a plan that, uh, you know, these Rohingya, so-called Rohingyas, illegal immigrants, they want to take over our country. That is the way how systematically they spread up anti-Rohingya campaign. As a result of that, what we have seen in 2012, a state organized violence by, you know, former military government. And we have seen in Sitwe, 140,000 Rohingya become IDPs. Their houses have been burned down, they push them to the camps. And humanitarian aid was blocked. If you look further, what's happened in, on that time? In 2012, July 11, President Thein Sein uh, met, uh, you know, current UN Secretary General. At that time, he was uh, UN High Commissioner for Refugees. The, when he talked about the solution about Rohingya issue, he said, there is no Rohingya in Burma. These are illegal Bengali illegal Bengali, uh, illegal Im immigrant Bengali people. The only solution is keeping them in the camps and sending them to the third countries. That is the systematic plan of long time military regime now until today we have seen. So that plan was systematically good. So he mentioned with his own words to current Secretary General, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. So if you look at 2014 census, Rohingya were excluded. And 2015 election, the first time in history for the Rohingyas, since 1937, Rohingya were not allowed to vote and not allowed to be a member of parliament. That is what the first time political, you know, politically Rohingya were not allowed to participate to vote and to member of parliament. And what's happened in 2016 October when Rohingya militants attacks, you know, the military post, more than 100,000 Rohingya were driven them out. That time, thousands of Rohingya been killed too. And UN special reporter Young Healy mentioned it was crime against humanity. She visited there. And you, we have looked at what's happened this side, NLD government. <coughs> I'm sorry. NLD government, UN, Dao San Suu Kyi State Consular Office, this rape are not happened. There is fake rape, you know, she defend the military, we have seen that time. So when we come back in 2017, August, 25th of August, when large exodus happened, she defended systematically the military. On that time, I was in Bangladesh, visited for four weeks last year. 
and thousands of Rohingya been killed, thousands of Rohingya women been raped, and hundreds of children been burned alive, and hundreds of elderly men been burned alive. I, when I met the uh, Rohingya victims, they told me, you know, someone told me, uh, is a Rohima Begum from Ratirao. Is unspeakable the situation. And when she she, st uh, she saw the military rounded up the Har village in Ratirao, like more than twenty trucks. And after they rounded up military coming in Har village, and she saw as soon as military entered, eight years old boy was knifed to death straight away. Then the military entered her house. She was raped more than 20 minutes. While she was facing rape, while she was raped by the military, another military was slaughtered slow her husband. And the other military tried to rape her and she was managed to run away. She joined with other villages and she came to Bangladesh. And one man told me from Tula Tuli. He's about 65 years and he saw with his own eyes his daughter was raped by the military and his grandson two years was thrown to the fire and burned alive and the other side his, his compound is very big the other side his son was slaughtered and he was hiding in one place. He just looking at that. Can you imagine what the situation he faced? And then when I was there more than four weeks, hundreds of stories I heard. It's unspeakable. I don't know how to express that, honestly, myself. So that is what we have seen, mass killings. If you look at the genocide, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they strip up our ethnic rights, citizenship rights, and impose restrictions on movement, marriage, education, and create popular violence, and burn down our houses, and push us to the camps, and block the humanitarian aid. Finally, in 2017, they did mass killings, Rohingyas, according to some reports. Reliable reports from Canada, more than 24,000 Rohingyas have been killed. Burmese military and government, I would say here, the Aung San Suu Kyi rule. Military and the government, parallelly, systematically, hand in hand, they join. And of course, this genocide was planned by the military. But NLD government have full responsibility because the Aung San Suu Kyi defended the military. Everybody talk about she has no power. You know, she has the power to defend these atrocities not happen. That is what we have seen her rule. And 2017, on her homepage, fake rape, these are fake news, that is how she distributed to the diplomats from her office. And she does not know why these people have been fled. You know, why I'm talking about, I campaigned for her in 2010 and 2009 and 2008. We campaigned for her release and other political prisoners. You know, Rohingya's been supported more than 30 years for the human rights and democracy for Burma. <laughs> Rohingya party, Rohingya party were alliances with NLD. I remember when I talked with her in a phone conversation after she released one week after, she said that these are basic human rights issues. 
When democracy comes one day, everything will be fine. That is what her own words. So today I'm telling she is no hope for our country because she defends the military. She is not only she is defending the military. She, as a constitutional issue, she is not raising about. And for the other peace process, she is not talking about it. We can't see any thing she is progressing for our country. We supported for the women rights and democracy for Obama. We, it's not about we support Suji. We, as a leader of NLD government, we supported Don Sen Suji. But we supported the system. In Burma, the system is we are supporting the, you know, as a leader of the, you know, the person only. It's not about personal issue. It's about pre in principle. And in Burma today, we have seen anti-Rohingya campaign is still spreading up. Everybody, because of her failure, people are talking about a stand, we stand with Suji. She knows what is happening. But unfortunately, she is taking side of the military. So for the international role, I want to bring out here. Internationally, we have seen Security Council have sat down many times. But we want to see concrete, you know, resolutions from Security Council. We want to see, you know, a stronger action, which is practical action, can provide safety, security, and protection for the Rohingyas in Burma. Of course, we support ICC referral. We've been campaigning for it. We need more to do to support ICC in UN Security Council and other members. You know, military criminal Ming Ong line, we must bring him to International Criminal Court. We will not forget, for myself, I've been in refugee camps many times. I remember my big team, my brothers and sisters, who told me their story. They, they say three words, we want justice. This is the word we cannot forget as a Rohingya. We must bring him to international criminal court, including whoever supported this military. If Dao Sesuchi, she has any we can find out, we have to bring her to. We have to look at how she, how she communicate by writing. Because military is telling is because of Dosu government give the order. That's we need to look at that point too, you know. So we can't let them go. We are human beings. For the human rights and democracy in Burma, one million Rohingya will not sacrifice at all. We are human beings, we will do our best. So, my dear brothers and sisters, we support ICC, we welcome UN fact-finding mission report, 27 of October, 27 of August. It is a historical day for the Rohingya because we've been crying, we've been talking to the international community. This is genocide, many years. They never listen to us. But finally, UN fact-finding mission found out it's a genocide. So the big teams, whatever they say, this is true. We must bring now perpetrators to the ICC. We must bring them to the justice. <laughs> and when we talk about justice, we cannot forget our half million Rohingya brothers and sisters where their lives are at risk in Burma. We must look for what protection we can provide. We call in international community, what mechanism they can have to protect half million population in Burma. This is in our kind of state. This is very important issue too. And as a genocide victims, the, we have seen 700,000 Rohingya Genocide survivors were fled to Bangladesh. We have to look at how we can build up, how we can empower our community. You know, this is very important. We cannot let 
Burmese government and military, they are destroying our community. But we cannot let them go. We have to get to take international communities this opportunity. We must build up our community. We must empower our community. One day we can be a part of in Burma society. So as we belong to Burma, we want to see, we want to go back to Burma. So it is important we have to rebuild our community. And I would like to express many thanks to all brothers and sisters for your solidarity, for your support uh, for, uh, for the Rohingya people. Also, I want to talk about here, when we see this genocide UN fact-finding report, it's not only for the Rohingyas, you know, this is time for other ethnic minorities, our brothers Rakhine, Karen, Shan, Shin, Shan, you know, all the ethnic minorities been facing many years under of this military regime. So it is time for all ethnic brothers and sisters to come forward to work with Rohingyas and to fight for justice for all the victims. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much.